Well, thank you, Brother John. Good morning, everybody. Glad to have you with us on this early morning and to open up and look at the Word of God rightly divided. I am very excited to be a new pastor. Not that I haven't been in the pastorate before, but I have a new church, at least it's new to me, uh, the Grace Bible Fellowship of Inverness, Florida, and uh, we have two pastors at least here that know a great deal about that particular church because they've been past pastors. I'm speaking to my brother John and also Wes Bartek, and uh, they have done a magnificent job with those people. They are loving, they're warm, they're huggy, and we don't want anybody here to come to Florida on vacation without coming to visit our church there in Inverness. And um, I think that you'll really have a great time with this. They are in love with the Lord and with each other. And that second part is just as important, I think, uh, to know each other in the Lord. So at this time, let's open up the word to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to continue there in the vein of godliness. Now that word godliness is a word that's only used in the pastoral epistles of Paul. Uh, the demonstration of godliness is used throughout the Bible, but when it comes to the word itself, we have to come to First and Second Timothy and Titus to really see it evolved and explained in a very Pauline way. Years ago, there was uh, a man by the name of John Randolph Hearst, and he was uh, a magnet in the newspaper business. And he not only did the, the newspapers, but magazines and all kinds of publishing. He was a multimillionaire, and probably in today's standards, he would be considered a billionaire. But he was an art hound. By that I mean that he loved masterpieces of art, and he had the money that he could afford to buy just about anything that he wanted. In fact, he had a big warehouse full of masterpieces that he would take his friends and his relatives on tours many times. In the course of his research on art, he came across a certain masterpiece that just really touched his heart, and he had such a burning desire to have this, so he sent his representatives out in the field to find this wonderful piece of art. And after some time, they came back and they said, we cannot locate it. We did, we've done all kinds of research, and we've looked at who has owned this piece in the past, and it seems as though the trail went cold. And uh, he encouraged his men, keep on trying, keep on trying. So about three months later, here they come, and the declaration is, we found it. And uh, the boss, big boss, wanted to know where in the world was it located. And they said, it was in your warehouse. <laughs> you had apparently bought it many years ago and had stored it away for safekeeping. And he couldn't believe that that precious thing was already in his possession. Well, that's kind of like the grace of God with many people in the, in the, in the uh, Christian faith, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and yet how little we appreciate this vast wealth. And Paul prays that we might understand and apprehend the, the exceeding riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, the inheritance that he has in us. Well, we have a great inheritance in him as being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, but he also wants to appreciate how valuable we have become to him. And it's not because of anything that we are or what we have done, but rather who Christ is and what he's done for us. With that in mind, let's begin reading here in chapter number 6 and verse number 6. And we're going to be looking at true riches and what we might call the uh, fool's gold or that which uh, people are pursuing but are not finding satisfaction. Chapter 6 of verse Timothy and verse 6 
But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drowned men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. May God add his blessing to the scripture reading this morning. This particular passage is dealing with the wealth of God and who we are in him and the appreciation of that great wealth that he has freely given to us by grace. Many years ago in my former profession, I was a salesman. I had my own business. And I remember when I was in the teaching profession for a short period of time, uh, it seems as though the Lord was leading me out of that public school system and into uh, some other areas of my life, and I was looking for a way to make a living. And uh, I started selling encyclopedias, and I did very poorly for about three months. I, I just said, I could not be a salesman. <laughs> But then in one of the calls that I made, it was a man that uh, had his business with the vacuum cleaners. And he said, how are you doing with these books? And I said, well, I've only sold one set in the three months that I've been here. He says, I have a product I think that you would be able to sell and do very well out. And, and I'm very impressed with your presentation, by the way. He said, you come in Monday morning, and I'll tell you what it is and, and how you can make a great deal of money. And so I did. And after the first two months with the Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners, I was the top salesman in my area of Springfield, Missouri, which enabled me to buy my own business uh, with that, and I was in that for 12 years. Uh, made a very good living, and I did well enough to where I didn't have to work all the time. I had time to study theology and, and develop uh, speaking and teaching and so forth. And I thank God for those times that I had together. But when I went into somebody's home and did a demonstration of my product, uh, we had a certain part of that presentation that was called the vacuum kill. And what that was is that no matter what kind of a vacuum that they had in their home, they could have just spent $1,000 yesterday. I could take that machine and show all of the shortcomings of it. I would highlight that and how my product was superior and how that it fit all the needs that this uh, other brand X was not able to fulfill. And I did it very well. And I think about God and the perfection of the gift that he's given to us. How many people are pursuing the, the fool's goal today, thinking that that is somehow going to fulfill their need to make them happy, to give them joy and peace? There are four facts that we need to understand about the dangers of riches. Wealth number one, uh, rather, fact number one, wealth does not bring contentment. Wealth does not bring contentment. And we know that because we've seen what it's done to the movie stars and the billionaires and how it actually becomes a burden oftentimes to lead them down the wrong path. Contentment is that inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of the outward circumstances. Let me say that again. The inner sufficiency to keep us at peace in spite of the outward circumstances. And may I say that our sufficiency is Christ. It's a person. It's not a thing. It's not a bunch of 
blessings, so-called, although those are nice. We, we enjoy those spiritual blessings of forgiveness and redemption, reconciliation, and, and, and the list goes on and on. But if we forget the person of who made that possible, then we're omitting, uh, omitting the heart and, and the soul of our blessing. Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He had that inner sufficiency of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And isn't that the same sufficiency that we enjoy today? Amen. He goes on to say in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little. And I appreciate bodily exercise because there's been times that I've had a bad back and, and I found that that helps a great deal. Uh, my wife has suffered for the past couple of months from a bad back and she's benefited greatly through the water aerobics program and, and being able to go to a pool and, and work some of that out. And, and we continue to pray for that. And um, even with the athletes, it, it is profitable for a certain time. But after a while, when the body begins to age, um, it's all for naught, it seems. Bodily exercise profits for a little while, for the while that we are in the flesh, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise not only of the life that now is, but also of that which is to come. That the godliness that Christ produces in us today is going to keep reaping benefit throughout all the countless ages of eternity. And we are going to become the trophies of his grace. He is going to show us his eternal kindness all the way through the ages. And it's all going to become uh, because of what Christ is and what he has accomplished in us and through us to his honor and glory. Wealthy people are often known as going to psychiatrists because they can afford them. And oftentimes those same people are the ones that try to end their own life and sometimes are successful. We find that the poor, humble, working people often don't have time to feel sorry for themselves. That that labor intensity uh, does something not only for their body but for their souls as well. That God has created us to be creatures of labor and laboring for, hi for him, the master. So wealth cannot bring contentment, or we could also say that other word, fulfillment. That joy, that inner peace, that completeness that we enjoy by virtue of being in Christ and understanding the blessings that we have in him. Fact number two, wealth is not lasting. Look at verse number seven. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we shall carry nothing out. I think Job said something very similar to that in chapter one. Uh, I remember the story that uh, one of our preachers told many years from this pulpit um, he, he told the story about a multimillionaire who in his will, he, he had a clause there that he was to be buried with his Rolls Royce. And so when he was embalmed, they dressed him up in a tuxedo, they had a nice tie, and he had the gold uh, ring on his finger. And as they were lowering that Rolls Royce down into that big grave with him behind the wheel, one of the grave diggers turned to the other one and said, man, ain't that living? <laughs> That's really the way to go. <laughs> well, it's been well said that we can't take it with us, but we can send it ahead, can't we? We can labor for the master, and that money that we have accumulated, when we're gone, we can send it ahead. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, to make a will. And in the midst of that will, have a generous provision for the work of the Lord. 
the work of the Brian Bible Society, BBF, the Things to Come Mission, the Word of Grace Mission, all of these worthy organizations. Um, and I've been on the board of the Brian Bible Society for a few years now, and I've seen what those gifts and in, in, in the, in the wills have done in propagating the gospel of grace. We would really be in uh, not too good a shape without the generosities of those that have made wills. And Bonnie and I have years ago determined that we would uh, leave behind some funds, a generous portion uh, to the Lord's work. And um, wealth is not lasting to be sure. If you look at verse number six again, this word godliness, I'm sure this has been defined numerous times because it's a main theme in the pastoral epistles, that uh, this godliness is from a Greek word, eusebeia, which means good worship, or uh, to be well-rounded in your reverence and your devotion to God. The English word is more of a God-likeness of developing the character traits of Christ in your life, one of which is generosity. So this wealth is not lasting, and when the question comes, how much did he leave when he died, the, the answer is always the same. He left everything. The Jewish Talmud has a famous saying that, more, that man is born with clenched hands, but he dies with his hands wide open. He cannot cling to those after death. And we know the parable that Jesus gave concerning the rich man, that he, uh, uh, he, he was blessed a great deal with great abundance of crops. And he says, I'll, I'll tear down my old barns. I don't have enough to, to, to hold all the, the fruits of my labor and, and those that are working for me. And I'll build, build even bigger barns to, to hold all the, the, the overflow. And my, my soul can take a rest and, and eat and drink and be merry. And the Lord said, this night your soul shall be required of you. And then who are you going to bestow your goods to? It's all going to the undertaker and to the dogs that are lapping up, the, the relatives that are fighting over your inheritance and so forth. So there it is. Wealth does not bring contentment, neither does it bring a, a long-lasting a benefit to you. Number three, our basic needs are easily met. Isn't that what he says in verse eight? And having food and raiment, that's clothing, let us be there with content. That is the bare necessity, according to the word of God, to have food for your body, to strengthen it, to give it fuel, and then clothing. And you might say, well, what about shelter and a good job? What about a car to get to work? Uh, what about the, the indoor plumbing and, 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 and uh, the, the, all the necessities there? And even a computer, we would think today, would be uh, a necessity, would it not? Well, I look at the material goods of our world in three different categories. We have, first of all, our necessities, of which Paul said is merely food and raiment. Then we have what is called the needs, that we need certain things to get by in this modern world. We need a car, a telephone, we need utilities and, and computers, and it seems like that you can hardly even exist today without some of these things. Uh, we live in a society that uh, if you're going to make a living for you and your family, you're going to need these things, and God uh, knows that, and he supplies that need. And then, of course, the third category is the wants or the greeds that we have. Uh, the story was told years ago about a wealthy man and his family that moved next to uh, door to the uh, Quaker man. And, of course, we know the Quakers, that they are very conservative, very modest, uh, very, that they hold the things of the world very loosely. 
And so when they were moving in, the Quaker man thought that he would be friendly and go over and welcome them to the neighborhood. And he saw all the, you know, the big power boat that was in uh, the driveway and all the beautiful furniture that was going in, the silver and the gold. And uh, he went up to the man and said, if you need anything, uh, please come and see me and I'll tell you how to get along without it. <laughs> and the man, yeah, yeah, maybe there's something to that. And, uh, and that Quaker really was living on a higher level even than the man. And so we see that here in chapter 4, well, let's go back to Philippians chapter 4. And here is a beautiful example of God supplying the need of his children. And I believe that this promise is not given to every believer. I used to think that, but as you read the context, the promise is given to those that are faithful to supply the needs in the ministry. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. <clears throat> Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul said, I know how to uh, suffer uh, d deprivation. I know how to abound with all kinds of blessings that God has given me materially. I've had it both ways. And he says, at this point in my life, I've come to a point where I say, who cares? <laughs> the Lord is going to be glorified through either way or both. And that's, that's what my ministry is about. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed, and I believe God was the instructor, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And that's a life verse of Paul. He was, according to the ministry, able to do all things through the power of God, which is really the grace of God operating in his life by faith. And this is the promise that I'm getting up to in verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need. Now notice he does not say the Lord's going to supply all of your greed or all of your wants but all of your needs according to his riches of glory by Christ Jesus. Now that phrase according to is a measurement term. I could, I could bring out a ruler and I could say it, according to my ruler, this pulpit is two and a half feet wide. That is a measurement. And Paul says, according to the measurement of the gift of Christ, and the riches and glory that he has, he is far able and sufficient to supply your need in every area of your life. And these Philippians were the only people, or the only church that he established, that would communicate and share their bounty with Paul. They would send gifts way out there in the mission field for him to partake in. And Paul says, those kind of people have a special promise that God is going to supply according to his riches and glory. And I believe that those that have a stingy heart and are not attuned to the grace of God uh, cannot claim that promise. You may disagree, but I, I truly believe that. That Christ is sufficient for his people as they generously open up their pockets. So our basic needs are easily met. Finally, the desire for riches leads to sin. The desire for riches leads to sin. Verse number 9 says, But they that will be rich, now notice it does not say those that are rich, but those that have a desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. Now how could that be? 
What are some of the temptations that they can fall into according to your experience? Well, what about young people that get out and uh, they've had high standards of living and they've gone through college and they, they got, they're married, they have a nice uh, little family started and they want to continue that same lifestyle into their early marriage. And so they get one of these little pieces of plastic and they begin to charge, charge, charge. And pretty soon we find that the interest begins to accumulate and to accumulate and to accumulate. Because they want all of the baubles, all of the furniture, all the beautiful draperies and carpeting, the beautiful cars that their parents had. And it's not that they're doing that well, but they're in debt on a higher level. And uh, they've already violated the biblical command not to owe any anyone anything but to love one another and so they start out life in debt and they're always playing catch-up and that stress and all of the, the vicissitudes of life begin to rain down upon them because of their greeds and wants sometimes when people get into debt they begin to think of uh, dishonest ways to uh, make a buck uh, we had somebody in our community not too long ago that worked for the bank for many years. And over a period of those years, it was dis discovered that he had cleverly embezzled thousands and thousands of dollars. And uh, now he's in prison, and they've pretty much thrown away the key. There was another man that we heard of that got into debt and went with a mask on face and, and robbed a bank. And shortly thereafter, he was caught. And uh, he's serving a 15-year prison sentence. Um, on television, I sometimes watch this uh, um, program called The Forensic Files. Have you ever seen that one? My wife says I shouldn't be watching those kind of shows <laughs> because it gives me ideas of how to do away with her. <laughs> and I said, dear, it's just the opposite. Anybody that watches this show ought to be, uh, see that they're going to get caught because for every murder that is committed, even those that have been carefully planned, the detectives figure that they've made between 40 and 50 mistakes that can now be detected through their forensic files. And so that is a deterrent to crime, not an incentive to one. But in those programs, there are wives, husbands, employees that have cleverly tried to do away with their spouses or their bosses to get the inheritance or the insurance money and how the detectives are able to track them down through the forensic evidence. And um, those people that thought that they were going to be living the high life for the rest of their life are now in prison for many, many years, sometimes even life sentences. And how does Paul say it here? In the last... Part of verse 9, he says that they have, um, they have entered into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drowned men in destruction and perdition. And that lust for money and the things that money can buy for them, the comfort, the security, the, the, the blessings of material wealth is a, a picture, as Paul says, of a drowning man. A man that is overcome with, with, with riches and, and, and the detriment that comes from that. Notice verse 10 says that money is not really the evil or the issue here. It's the heart. He doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money. And God says that when we receive Christ as our personal Savior, that that Holy Spirit of promise came into our hearts, and now the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by that Spirit, and we thank God that that is part of the blessing of grace. But it doesn't happen automatically. 
That is why Paul said, even in spite of your love, that you are taught of God to, to love each other, I want you to abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And this is not the kind of love that the world propagates. It's a sacrificial love. It's the love of the cross that he's implanted within us. And it's an unconditional love. It's a love that will not let us go. Jeremiah says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. A love that will never end, no matter what. It's not based upon your behavior. It's not based upon your character building. It's based on that cross. And if you hinge the love of God on anything other than that cross, uh, you're on shaky ground. A man is diagnosed with terminal cancer. And the first thing that the enemy brings to mind is that God has forsaken me. He no longer cares. And nothing can be further from the truth. We had a man in our church uh, that got saved. And uh, he had a very rough life. Uh, when when you, he was walking down the sidewalk, if you happened to bump into him, he would be liable to throw you off the sidewalk. He was just that kind of a guy. But when he got saved, the generosity of his heart, I think if he had a gift, it was generosity because he, he had a wonderful business and he just loved to give to that business. And he asked me a question one day. If Paul was altogether holy, why did he get his head cut off? <laughs> and I said, well, what about Jesus Christ? <laughs> Why was he crucified? <laughs> because people don't like the truth. And uh, they want to get rid of, of any reminder of how they've fallen short. And, and the indwelling sin and so forth. And so it, it's the same idea here. That the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And he just wants to use us as instruments of that love to others. However, a desire for riches leads to sin. This passage does not contemplate those that have inherited riches or maybe have a gift for making a great deal of money to help the Lord's work. But it's talking about those who desire above all else that, ha that, that, that want to be rich in the material things. And I remember years ago when I was between jobs, I was looking for something that would help me with a little extra income. And I had a friend that got into Amway and, and I'm, not, I'm not bucking Amway. They have some great products. And, and I, I, I should probably still be using some of those products. Uh, but they had uh, something that was called the Dream Circle. And if you've ever been in Amway, you may know what I'm talking about. Uh, part of building the business is to have friends, relatives, acquaintances come to your home and you lay out the whole thing, the program of how you can make money in this business. And, and part of that was drawing a circle on the board that was called the dream circle. And uh, the question was, if you had the money and you could afford it, what would you put in that dream circle? And some would say, well, you know, I put a Cadillac in there, or I, I put a, a trip to Bermuda, or I put my, college, my uh, son's college education, whatever you wanted, you could put in that dream circle. And see, what they were doing is trying to revive that lust for material things to motivate you to get into the business and to work the business. And uh, it worked very well. You know what Paul says about that? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things, which are where? Up at the right hand of the power of the majesty on high, the Lord Jesus, and not on things on the earth. For you have died to those things, and your life is hid with Christ in God.
And no matter how powerful a person is, not even the devil can find something that the Lord has hidden. And that's where your life is. It's hid in God's vault at the Father's right hand. This temptation is to adopt questionable ethics in the business world. One thing that impresses me about the teaching of Paul is what I call the replacement principle. That God never takes away anything, but what he replaces it with something a thousandfold better. That will last forever, for time and for eternity. And so when we come to this passage, we think of the principle of separation, which is another way of saying godliness, of developing the godly character of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. Remember the first king of Israel? What was his name? Saul. And Saul was a very beautiful man. He had great stature and strength. He looked like a king, and he started out very well. He defeated a, a great deal of the, of the uh, nation Israel's enemies, and he became really a symbol of power and strength. And yet when he left the Lord and lost his focus of obedience to the word of, of the Lord, we see there that he ended very tragically on the field of battle. He even went to a witch to consult with familiar spirits, another violation of God's command. And when he saw that the enemy would come and torture him and abuse him, he chose to fall upon his own sword. But the sword didn't kill him. He was in horrible agony, and he begged another soldier to end his life, which the soldier did and was later punished for it by King David. But this is very much the same thing of those that seek after the things of the world and the lusts of the world. How does Paul say it in, the, in, in verse number 10? Well, the love of money is the root of all evil, Notice here, a better translation, I believe, would be, uh, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. There are many types of evil that money has nothing to do with. Um, but it's certainly a great deal of the evil comes through the, the lust for money and what money can do. They have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's as though they have fallen upon their own sword and like King Saul, continued to suffer for the rest of their life. And how many people there are in the prisons and those even outside the prisons that they are in prison, a prison of their own making that they look back in life with dreadful regret because of the unwise choices that they've made. Come back to the book of Philippians again. And I alluded to this passage, but I think we need to look a closer, a little bit closer at this chapter one of Philippians. And there in chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, And this I pray, this is my prayer for you believers, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Now, when we think of the cushy kind of love of the world, the human affection, the huggy, warm, fuzzy type of love, and I'm not knocking that, there's, there's a place for that among Christians, and there ought to be. But this love is the love of the cross that esteemed others better than themselves. And the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to do the will of the Father, but he also loved us with that everlasting love 
that went to that cruel cross to become our sin substitute. Have you ever heard the expression, to know him is to love him? I think we've heard that. And how appropriate that is when we think of Christ. Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings that I might be made conformable to his death. And that's just Paul's way of saying, I want to be like my master. I want to grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to know him not only that he's the son of God, that he's the creator of mankind. I want to know him as the guide and Lord of my life. Why? In order that I can be able to approve or put to the test the things that are excellent. Some have translated this to test things that differ. And it, this word excellent does mean a, differ, a differentiation between two choices. But it's more than that. It's looking at two or more things and choosing the thing of the greater value. Did you not know that in the Christian life, our choices are not merely between good and evil, but between that which is good and that which is God's best? The things that are excellent. We have in our neighborhood of Florida a place called Disney World. And I've been there. Very enjoyable. I'm not against amusements. But what about the person that calls you up on Saturday night and says, Hey, we and our family are going over to D Disney World. Would you like to join us? Well, yes, I would like to join you, but I've got, I've got to go to church tomorrow. I've got to go to church tomorrow? Why do you have to go to church tomorrow? Are you going to go to hell if you don't? You know, that, that's the way the world looks at it. And we have to be very sure that we explain what we mean. Not that I have to go to church, but I want to be where God's people are. And one of the great pieces of heritage that I had when I was saved in a grace church many years ago that it was instilled in me from the very beginning that when the church doors opened, that's where God's people ought to be. To make that choice, to choose the excellent thing that is going to please God. Money and the, the ability to earn money can be viewed at as a gift from God. There's nothing wrong with earning money under grace. And he that is first to uh, claim it, all of the material things do belong to God, ultimately. And he's only lending it to us for a short time. For our necessities and for the ministry. And by the way, this uh, idea of economics and the use of money, that's a very important subject in the Word of God. It's been said that there's more said about money in, in God's book, the Bible, than there is about prayer. I don't know if that's really true, but it's, it's, the point is well taken. There's a great deal that God puts here for our benefit about money and our treasure. Christians today have gone to two extremes. There is the extreme that God wants to make you wealthy to enjoy all of his bounty and the blessings of this world. And then there's the view that God despises the rich. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to be horribly confused about God's riches and, uh, and what you're to do with the wealth that he's given to you. First of all, in our dispensation, God does not promise us real estate. That was really the promise of the people of Israel to enter into the promised land, to have the blessings of rich harvest and good crops. Their animals would produce um, uh, uh, great flocks. They, they, they would be the head and not the tail. They would, in, they would be the most powerful and wealthy nation on the face of the earth if 
they obeyed the law of God. But if they failed in that, not only would God withhold the blessing, but he would pour upon them these horrible curses to discipline them, to bring them back into the bonds of the covenant. And God knew how to discipline his children, Israel. Did you know that in the tribulation it's going to be a sin to be wealthy? And why should we think that's so strange when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> Who was it that went to hell? Was it the rich man or Lazarus? <laughs> it was the rich man, wasn't it? And the man that built the barns that, that hold all of his uh, money and his, and his fruits and stuff, um, he didn't make it into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, when the rich young ruler came, he said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And um, he said, well, you know the commandments, you know. And he went through some of the commandments. And, and he said, Lord, I've done all of those things from the time I was a little boy. What yet lack I? And the Lord says, you go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And then you'll have riches in heaven. And the man went away sorrowful because he had great wealth. And I like what Peter said after that. He was taking all of this in, and, and they had given up everything. And he said, Lord, uh, we've given up our families, our livelihood, our jobs, our homes, our, everything that it was secure. What shall we have? And he said, well, you which have followed me in the regeneration, in that kingdom out there, when I come back and sit upon the throne of my glory, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wonderful, wonderful promise for that age. But it's not something that we are to put under grace. Look at another place in James chapter 5. Uh, I'm just going to read a few verses. I don't think I even need to make a commentary here. But you remember that in the tribulation to come, that Antichrist is going to hold sway over all nations. And you will not be able, you, I say the people that are alive there, will not be able to buy or sell until they take the mark of the beast. And God is going to supernaturally sustain them in the wilderness for several years. And so to the rich men that lived during that time, of which I believe James is writing to, he says, Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. The gold and silver is cankered. The rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped uh, together treasure for the last days. It's going to be a sin to be a wealthy man in that dispensation. But God says, if you're under grace, you may have a desire to be rich, and you may go about it the wrong way, and, and you're going to be pierced through with many sorrows. But if you've inherited, or you have an ability to make money, you use that for the Lord and for his glory, to help build up those that are in the saints. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Laterno, and uh, Laterno was a mechanical genius. Uh, he developed machinery that is used even to this day. Uh, sometimes you'll see it out on the interstate. It's a big machine that, that chews up concrete. And uh, he, he devised a method of, uh, of doing that very efficiently. And he, he made all other kinds of machinery that's used in construction and so forth. And he made multiple millions of dollars um, but when you went to his house, it was just a little modest, little home that he had in the suburbs. And we talk about tithing. Um, not the grace people so much, but many people speak of tithing. 
But this man, it was estimated, gave 97% of his income to the ministry and many different kinds of ministry. And he kept only 3% for himself, just enough to get by. And what a testimony that was to so many people that we are to profit as the Lord has profited us, but we are to give also to the work of the ministry as God has prospered us. God does not despise the rich, but he wants the rich to use those riches that they might be sent ahead to where they can benefit in that future day. That when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And God is desiring to form that image of grace and his godliness in us. The spirit of grace that he has given to us as a free gift is that which works and desires to do his good pleasure. And God says, you have your field, go out and work it. Make use of that gift that God has freely given to you. Let's pray today. Give him thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gift of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for believers of like precious faith that we can join hands in and to work together for the faith of the gospel, that we might promote the glory and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to show his moral perfections to those that are looking for something better, that are looking to fill that void that they still have in their soul that only Christ can fill. Give us that grace by which we can stand before you someday and say, I've done a small part in this field called the grace of God. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise. In his blessed name we pray.